Poe, welcome to The Gauntlet. What, what do you think of my new format, by the way? I think it's going to be really fun to participate in and maybe not quite as fun to watch. But I'm really happy <laughs> for everyone who is watching this. If you're listening to me talking, that means you're watching. Yeah, for, the, for at least the first five seconds. You should probably... Oh, ten, it's going to be so fun now, to watch. <laughs> <laughs> ten minutes from now, ask them to comment something specific and then we'll see how many people are actually watching the show rather than just... Who's Poe again? Oh yeah, <laughs> then, like close the video out. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, round one. Do you want to talk about music, economics, or cosmology? I definitely don't want to talk about music or cosmology, so it's got to be economics. Economics feels like the staple for our little corner of the internet, right? Mm. Uh, free markets inherently lead to unacceptable levels of inequality. Behavioural economics proves that decisions are often irrational or national debt is a ticking time bomb. I've got to pick one of these just to argue about either pro yeah. or either for or against. I, ideally, you tell me in advance which side you're going to take. Uh, once or <laughs> twice, I've, I've allowed guests to just kind of launch into a pros and cons list and then decide at the end. <laughs> yeah, well, I think you've, you've picked In theory, very, the show uh, is... The show is meant to be you pick a side and argue for it, debate club style. Okay. So. I'm going to pick a side and then pretend that I really firmly believe what yeah. I'm saying. And I trust That's in, in you to mm -hmm. provide good counter arguments. I'm not going to try and help okay. you by being even handed. All right. Uh, so if I do a bad job, then you will feel annoyed that the, <laughs> that the, the nuance has been missing. Yeah, I might have to. If I feel like you're not, uh, you're not providing the right counter arguments, I might have to. Uh, I see. You know. All right, I'll do my best. I don't know what I'll do. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think free markets inherently lead to unacceptable levels of inequality. Well, I think that's just not true. I think there is no unacceptable level of inequality. I think that the the true measure of a society's success is by how how high the the reach of the of the most intelligent the most talented the the most entrepreneurial elite can reach the top. yeah the top i think the, the the you know the elites are the uh the leaders of the society that's that's the people who will be remembered and if we allow them to do everything that they want to do um all the good stuff i mean not the bad stuff <laughs> <laughs> then uh, we'll we'll all reap the benefits, and uh, it's it's usually better for for the little guy. And uh, spoken in terms like of economic a, a terms. true Randian. Yeah, no, I think but in economic terms, I am pretty pretty Randian. Randian. <clears throat> but what about the Gini index is correlated with violence? <laughs> uh, I I I've heard that. And I just don't believe Jordan it. Peterson used to say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I think the, that data. Viol if you've got like a violence problem, that's like because you're not authoritarian enough. enough in my that's kind of separate <laughs> from free markets. It's like if you've got a problem where you've got the um, you know, the down and outs uh, causing a lot of trouble, then then perhaps there's not enough economic opportunities for them. In which case, I don't think you really have a a, a true free market that, that I think would allow opportunities for the um for the lowest in society to sell their labor doing the you know even the most menial tasks and if you've got a bunch of psychopaths or uh, really useless people who are literally good for nothing so that they they can't be paid <laughs> even a pittance <laughs> then um then it's the criminal justice system's fault for um for letting them for letting them do that now there are other so, problems with free markets, but we're not here to debate those. We're just talking about inequality. Okay. Do Do you agree with the the correlation though that that the freer the markets, the higher the inequality? So your if dispute you're is the, you're just about with the, the word inequality. inequality. Yes, if, and, if, and, if, and the moral the, overloading of that. Yeah. yeah. So it, it, the word unacceptable, I think, is the problem in it's this. Your problem. Um, I think free markets do lead to high levels of inequality because people who are who are really talented and really intelligent and very entrepreneurial they'll get more opportunities and those opportunities will allow them to do more and they've got <laughs> lots of capital to play with so they'll be making huge investments 
And when those huge investments pay off, they'll make even better profits. So it does lead to this sort of runaway effect. Um, but I think the idea that the, the the people in the society with the least will will end up extremely violent or extremely resentful is evidence of a, if it does happen, I think it's probably evidence of a different social ill and not the fault of the inequality of in and of itself. So I, I think a I think it's reasonable to say that there's that there ought to be uh, inequality in income. Uh, but the, there there can be genuine problems associated with the accumulation of capital. Um, you, you must have come across this idea, or well, this is another Peterson thing, the, the Matthew principle, um, that in any, uh, in any even very simplified model of the economy where there are random trades and the possibility to end up bankrupt at zero, over time, um, regardless of the input or the the skill level or anything of the players you know if you if you model this in a computer you can do it millions of times and you will find that all of the resources eventually accumulate with a small number of people and it's called the matthew principle because there's this line that jesus says that to those who have more will be given and to those who have little even what they do have will be taken away um and i'm arguing that this is unacceptable because it's not fair, it's not desirable, um, and it's it's not morally right uh, for the poor to lose even the small amount that they have just because they're caught up in the maelstrom of a, um, an unregulated market. Well, I think you're right that... Um, in, in a truly free market, the poor will always have opportunities to make bad decisions. That is gambling, selling their organs, or uh, just uh, <laughs> or gambling, <laughs> selling themselves no into slavery. Yeah, I think um, that, that that probably would happen. Uh, but I think that when you when you have a truly free market and you let people truly feel the consequences of their bad actions, <laughs> instead of cushioning the the effects of um, their decisions, then what you get is that they are forced to 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 what's the word to express some self restraint, and it, also the people around them will uh, will be uh, they'll be induced to restrain them, um, or mm -hmm. they'll sort of push them out of their lives. I think um, I, I think we I think we have to let people be free to make bad decisions and and that will uh ultimately have a eugenic effect because the uh because the <laughs> the lowest in society with the least self-restraint will not have the resources to pass on their genes oh, all right it's all very high-minded to assume that the only way down is through bad bad decision making if you you, you play poker, in a free right? market i think it is in a truly free so, market i think uh that would be the case you, well, I, I'm going to argue against that premise. You know, in poker, um, there tends to be the buy-in increase. So if you're playing an evening's worth of, of a game like poker, um, you, you will increase the buy-in um, amount over time. And there's there's going to be players who have more chips over time and players who are on their way out. And the... the, the on a given hand, if uh, if there's a large bet in play, and the rich player loses, they've probably only lost one percent of their total accumulated value that, that that they've made over the course of the evening. Whereas the player who's there, right on the teetering on the brink of bankruptcy, that maybe they go all in on that round, and if they lose then they're out and that's final so over the course of enough of these events the the rich players playing equally well will survive and the poor players will lose everything that they had and i'm arguing that the same thing happens in the economy say for example uh buying houses right if you 
can if you are a giant bank you can borrow at an incredibly low interest rate you can bust in and buy the ha it's like if you go the first time round a monopoly board you kind of just want to buy every house that you land on if you can if you don't mm -hmm. have the money you can't make the sensible economic decisions so there's just this this set of I guess it's often described as how expensive it is to be poor. There's kind of a vicious cycle that happens at the bottom of the economy. Yeah, I think that 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 is true. And yet that in, in real life, what we see is that this provides an opportunity <coughs> for lenders to, yes, they lend at a, at a higher interest rate, but if you can prove yourself to be a, a, a person of good moral character, with someone who will, you know, guarantee your loan, then mm -hmm. you, you can get you, you can get the big guy. The, you know, the lender has an incentive to to lend to you, and you you know, if you make good decisions and you're you know you're good at what you do, then you you can move up. And it's not to say that you'll ever reach the heights of the bank or Elon Musk, but you can at least keep the you know keep your wolf from your door, and uh, you know make a living for your family, and maybe your children will reach higher heights than uh, than you did in your life if that's what you care do you think, about do you think it's true that the rising tide um lifts all all ships this idea that the the poor today are materially better off than the poor 50 years ago and it's, it's a difficult situation because we you know as we discussed the uh you know, the true capitalism has never been tried. True, true free markets. <laughs> so this may or may not tried. be a reflection of yeah. Uh, and it's, to to it's the also, degree um, that we've lived in a free market, has it had? That yeah, effect? I think. Well, if you read Thomas Sowell, I think he argues in some of his books that the war on poverty is really the like war on poor people. <laughs> in the effects that it's had <laughs> on the on the lives of the poor and the decisions that they make it's really just been a catastrophe if you if you believe thomas soul that they like, as i said at the start if you if you try to help the the poorest people in society all you do is you kind of encourage them to continue <coughs> making bad decisions um sorry mm. to repeat myself I've, uh, I've forgotten exactly what your question was precisely well yeah, the rising time you know lifting all ships i think in a free market um, in a free market you know, capitalist system, I think that would be the case. And there would be some people who would lose out, but it would probably be their their fault. And you can say that it's not really their fault because they were born with, with bad impulse control and they, and, they were, and they were born with low intelligence. Um, but, but if you're going to include that, life. there's no such thing as fault. <laughs> like if you're going to argue yes, that exactly. somebody's <laughs> brain yeah. is an excuse, then what else? Like what possible? Uh... You have to excuse everything, then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, uh, you know what? I'm going to give you 13 points for round one. I thought that What's was it out? Uh... out of what? <laughs> it's just a f like floating point. <laughs> In in What's in the space of all numbers. What's the highest number? Are there that negative a, numbers? That is a question for a mathematician. <laughs> uh, nobody's got a negative number yet. But, I'll have to, you I'll know, have to watch out perfectly and find out what the highest score is. <laughs> well, what, the one thing you do have is there's a high score table at the end of the show, so you can find out whether mm. or not thirteen was a generous number in about yeah. fifty minutes. Round two, ethics, history, or metaphysics? Oh, shoot. Uh, <laughs> it's got to be ethics. I mean, I don't know anything about history or metaphysics. I, th I think you'll make a, a strong stab at ethics. Creating AI that surpasses human intelligence is unethical. Freedom of speech should never be limited. Or redistributing wealth is a moral obligation of society. I can't mm. imagine with your Randian tendencies that you'll go through <laughs> supporting the third one. Yeah, I uh, I feel like the first question is less of an ethical question, more of a um, tr trying to come up with predictions about AI. Uh, yeah, it kind of it, it all hinges on what you would expect to happen due to the creating of a an AI that surpasses human intelligence. Um, just thinking out loud because I can't I haven't decided yet. 
Yeah, uh, sure. spe- freedom of speech should never be limited, I think, is a conversation we've had before. Uh, not you and I. I mean, it's just uh, it's been batted about a lot. It's very yeah. it's very 2018, <laughs> 2017. Well, ideally, we uh, can have a conversation that's never been had before. That would be great. That would be that would be perfect. Reading to reading wealth. I think we kind of already touched on it, although maybe not yeah. actually. Okay, I I would like to argue uh, uncharacteristically that you know un- a very unrandian way yeah, <laughs> that redistrib- yeah. redistributing wealth actually is a moral obligation of society and i now i always <laughs> this is embarrassing but i always confuse john locke and john stuart mill possibly because they're both called john <laughs> but i can't remember which one of them uh, who i'm thinking of now um but i think the the, the argument not definitely that he was making, but the, the my takeaway from reading, I think it was On Liberty. Who, who wrote On Liberty? Help me out. Uh, John you know, it was neither now. Okay, I've got it. I can't, <laughs> I've got it down to two Johns at least. Um, really, <laughs> yeah, so I, I was somewhat persuaded by this, um, by the ethical argument that, that it, uh, let's say, not as a government necessarily, but as an individual if you are wealthy you have been the beneficiary of many other people who have allowed you to be wealthy this is the um the part that's not very randian of the you know the individual um i believe the individual doesn't exist you know no man is an island and Mm. if you were if you were lucky enough to be born in england with enough resources to you know to, to be fed to be educated and due to those advantages that you received, you are able to become extremely wealthy or even moderately wealthy. I think you do have some, you do have some ethical noblesse oblige, mm. you know, to to help others to do the same, or at least to pay in as much as you got out. Um, I think what we what we often see in our, our, our progressive tax system is that the only people who are able to pay more into the tax system than they than they benefit from it are the the one percent of earners who are in an extremely highly taxed um, income bracket that they are actually the only ones who pay any net tax. And although I um, although we can we can quibble about how that money is being spent and whether we really need to tax people this much, I think there is <coughs> some level of Wealth, I wouldn't call it wealth redistribution because I, I don't believe in eating the rich or you know murdering the top 10 earners in the country and dividing their wealth between everyone. I do believe there is some some duty to pay back into the system that you benefited from. So um, I'm trying to think if, okay, in, in broad broad terms without uh, giving, without being un-British and giving far too much information away i'm i'm paid somewhere between 50 and 100k (laughs) right does that put me in the top one percent because i'm pretty sure i'm a net contributor of tax Uh, yeah no i think you are i think um you you may be in the one one percent i mean if i've say i've met 99 people i've met 100 people i have by the way (laughs) <laughs> a lot of those people are a lot of those people are engineers, so I wouldn't, uh, you know, they're probably you know, moderate. You just say I'm walking on the street, and there's a hundred people on the street. Okay, I think you're probably uh, a higher earner than ninety nine of, of them. them. You know, if, if you include children and and and, and the elderly, you know, you're yeah, definitely in the one. They are slackers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm just, imag- elderly, like, I'm just imagining. I'm just imagining church. Church is quite a good cross section of society, I think. So if I was in a I church think... with 100 people, would I be the top earner of everybody present? I Because I, I think, although you're right that there's lots of people, I, I'm, I'd be in the top 10%, but I'm also not at the eldest point of my, you know, people tend to earn more over time. So e- even though some people will earn drastically more at a given age, it's still the case that somebody who's about to retire is probably earning, you know, a multiple of what they earned as a graduate, right? Um, yeah. And also, so, I mean, if we're talking about income, it's slightly different to wealth because if you've 
paid off oh, a one million pound house, you're practically mm-hmm. a millionaire, but it's all in it's all in real estate. Even if you even if you're retired and you live in a one million pound house that you own, um, yes. you could be a millionaire. But we're talking about income. I we think, were talking about we're talking tax. About this tax question. Yes. So, <coughs> I yeah. I, so maybe it's just a quibble for me to say like, okay, the top five percent of people are. Paying I think tax. the top, like when people hear the top one percent, I think what they actually visualize is more like the top one thousandth, <laughs> you know, like yeah, the top 0.1 percent. Like, I think people don't really people think one percent and they think it's tiny, it's, tiny, it's, tiny. It's, it's nobody, and actually, you, you, you run into the one percent, as you say, if, yeah. you, if you go into a About supermarket, a day, there's yeah. probably several hundred people in that supermarket, so you're you're hanging out, you know, at the checkout with several one percenters. Hmm. Um, yeah, I they're think, the, yeah, they're they're the ones who've uh, shopped on the, you know, the top shelf. But, you know, the, the, the you know, the su- supermarket shoppers are kind of the dregs of society, aren't they? <laughs> you know, you're not getting the, <laughs> you're not That's getting the most bourgeois thing I've ever heard. Then, you know, I'm a, I'm a supermarket shopper, okay. I don't get a okay. cargo delivered or whatever. I'm just saying that the you know yeah, you're yeah, not yeah. getting the top slice of um, of people <laughs> when you go into a supermarket. No, you're you're getting the uh, hired help of the one percent. Mm, exactly. <laughs> That's who, uh, anyway, the, the, you, I, it, you're just stalling because you don't. I gave such a good argument that you you cannot you can't argue oh, yeah. with me. So you're you're quibbling. It, I am basically. I I yes, I'm struggling because I've been completely won over by your your argument. Uh, so you, you've okay. got to do the Randian we, thing now. <laughs> yeah, I have to switch hats and and pretend to be you from from round one um just just remind me what was the what was the basis of your arguments again the basis of the argument even... is that wealth doesn't just um wealth is not a completely ind- individual benefit like you don't just produce no. wealth on your own you have to exist in a system that has mm-hmm. good infrastructure the good education good nutrition uh, and all those things do not, do not just come from you and your parents. You also came from the society you were born into. That's right. So if yeah, and and you were saying it's your moral obligation to leave the world net zero. You should at least at, at have, least <laughs> you you should at least have given out as much value as you received from. Yeah, I want to be like um, you should be one of those people who builds like a a hospital wing. Or you ah. know, they they have a scholarship program that sends underprivileged, um, morally yeah. upstanding, intelligent teenagers to university. <laughs> if you build a hospital wing, that means that you're also entitled to to be in an entire hospital wing <laughs> when you when you're uh, in in your final days of your life. Mm. You can have an armada of nurses, like hundreds of them, because you've you've funded that to society. Would you would you take it the other way around that? If your your obligation is only as high <laughs> as as your income, and in the same way, if you give generously, you can also live lavishly. Because you could completely decouple those things and say that we should just give as much as we can, uh, independently of uh, of what we receive. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think the well, like I said, I think what you receive that, that these two, these two things are related. Like your there is a certain personal element of your own um, your own success, but yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, if you, yeah, I'm if not sure you, what you're suggesting. I suppose I suppose what I'm saying is your your argument is that uh, your obligations are connected to your what you receive from the universe and i guess i'm i guess i'm saying that's not necessarily true that okay i mean are you, you saying just that if you... seek to do as much good as you can uh regardless of what you are going to receive hmm. this is well, a think... this is a this is me um go, delving deep into the premises of your argument <laughs> rather than hmm. talking about the conclusion here Okay, so if you you think if you're extremely wealthy, for example, but you've had a hard life and you were, you know, you were born on the streets and had nothing but the spit from passers-by to uh, to nourish you, <laughs> then wow, you don't owe good. them. You don't owe them anything because they didn't. Uh... <laughs> well, yeah, I'd say that's that's one of the risks of your argument is that somebody could be patting themselves on the back because actually they they've. Uh... 
you, you know, I think that, their, I think that's their productive illusion, capacity, they, maybe they can produce, maybe everybody can produce 10 times what they receive and they get very self-satisfied because they've, they've just equalized when they had the potential to do so much more. You know, they, they mm. looked at what they, they received. This, this is actually, um, the parable that Jesus tells leading up to the Matthew principle, which is, which is that, uh, he, that this rich master gives uh he gives 10 talents to one servant he gives five talents to another servant and he gives one talent to another servant the guy who received 10 went and invested it and turned it into 100 and the the master says great i will put you over 10 cities and then the 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 second servant took his five and multiplied it up and turned it into 50 and the the master says great i'll put you over five cities and then the last one said, I knew that you were a cruel master and I was I was afraid of you because, you know, you, you were going to judge me harshly. So I buried the the one talent that you gave me in the ground. And here it is here. I'm going to give you the one talent that you that you entrusted me with. Um, and the master says to this last guy, um, you wicked servant. You could at least have put it in the bank, and then I would have got interest. Is literally, is literally what happens in this this crazy parable, and therefore I'm going to whip you and torture you and beat you up and send you out on the streets. <laughs> um, so I guess in the in the analogy, what I'm saying is that uh, somebody who is given much should should ter should multiply it not just preserve it like your yeah. obligations are much greater than just conserving i guess that's why the term conservative is such an unexciting like word <laughs> because mm. you, we 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 should do we should seek to do much better than just like trying not to muck up what we've inherited we should we should seek to build triumphant, amazing, you know, mm -hmm. structures of human engineering and uh, wondrous things that the planet has never even seen. Yeah. Well, I think that's what Elon Musk is doing. And um, when I was in Rome, uh, we we saw these beautiful villas. Uh, of course, the the villas from Roman times are mostly ruins, but even they, you know, from the ruins, you can tell what they must have been in their in their heyday. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the Renaissance villas um, that we saw in in Tivoli, they uh, they're kind of one of them was like built on the Roman ruin. Like they they loved the idea of a Roman villa so much that it was kind of like the the Dino book mansion of its time, I guess. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, <laughs> the you see all of this beautiful art that the, the um, that these incredibly rich men of their time um, commissioned. You know, they got the every wall in the villa is painted mm -hmm. and you know sculpted like to an extreme degree and we were walking around this place thinking like they imagine how much money he spent not just for his own benefit but also to support all of these artists who they mm -hmm. you know they created something that had never existed before they've painted this beautiful um mural or they've painted this beautiful ceiling they've tiled this beautiful floor and you, you as a patron have the opportunity to give this artist who's much less wealthy than you all this money to create this really beautiful thing that's still there 500 years later. And then today people would, you know, socialists would spit on this uh, extremely wealthy <laughs> man and say like, well, well, look at all this extravagant wealth that you spend. Like how gaudy, like couldn't you have yeah. given this to a poor beggar? This is so tacky. Yeah. Uh, but but the, it's not by redistributing the wealth that these great things were created. I, I don't think you can just equate commissioning a beautiful piece of artwork to a, a soup kitchen. Like it, it, in the they one, are different. Yeah. In, well, in the one case, um... like the Musk or some or Brunel or the, these titans, of the Carlylean, you know, great men of industry. Men. Yes. They need to have the resources funneled to them rather than away from them because they are the people who've 
proven their great stewardship and usage of these resources and it's yeah. it's irresponsible to redistribute the money away from them mm, i see what you mean now okay so elon musk is not actually i don't know if he started making profits on teslas yet but so far all of his profits are from investors uh, which mm. i guess are they're, they're not like charities they're not giving him the money but it mm -hmm. does require a great amount of sort of crowdsourcing even for an extremely wealthy man like elon musk he's only wealthy because his companies are valued that highly because people believe that they're they're going somewhere i don't know what my point is here but i uh no, i think you're right this <laughs> well, it is different like this redistribution of wealth it does conjure up an idea of a kind of a soup kitchen or a um you know a single yeah. mother getting a getting a weekly benefits but I think it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be that. And I think the, um, yeah, you know, the patronage is a, a good <laughs> example of that. Well, some somewhere between round one and round two, I've got pretty confused about who's on which side of the <laughs> argument. But I think the I think the point is that we've we've come out with a a broader view of both of these questions, and I'm going to give you fourteen. Oh wow! For Even round better. Two even better and still meaningless uh cinema and theater world affairs or epistemology oh cinema and theater like obviously i feel like you're tricking me with these like you're telling me like to have the easy round <laughs> and these are the two hard rounds that only really smart people will pick <laughs> <laughs> uh well i i do somewhat grade on a curve if you pick if you pick too easy of a question now you tell then, me uh, yeah. I didn't even know there were Pre points when I started this. <laughs> I score everything I do. This is, you know, just merely me revealing one small, small amount of my vast spreadsheet array uh, by which I uh, quantify all things. Creators have the moral responsibility to challenge society. Music is the most important element of a film, or entertainment is the primary utility of cinema. I, I think that well the thing is i really strongly agree with the two or yeah. i could make an argument for number two mm -hmm. um music is the most important element of the film i don't know if i can really argue it other than just say yes <laughs> uh creators <laughs> have a moral responsibility to challenge society something i strongly disagree with and i think uh -huh. entertainment is the primary utility of cinema is something i'm kind of conflicted on so maybe it'd be <laughs> interesting to argue one side of it all right. So, uh, so I think well, I'll, what, I'll... G given there's a link between one and three, then mm. feel free to weave both in. But which which oh, do you okay. want to pick? I think I'd like to argue about entertainment is the primary utility of cinema, and I might need to use your the the I, facility I'll that allow we you... discussed earlier. <laughs> to decide whether I'm for or against halfway through my opening statement. <laughs> so this is less less of a um, less of a persuasive essay and more of just mm. a discursive uh, thought of thought for the day on entertainment and cinema with Poe. Well, I think that entertainment is what sells tickets and what gets you in the seat. Mm. But ultimately, if you you finish a piece of cinema and all you've experienced is entertainment it'll be a very fleeting experience so i guess the, the real quibble is whether we use the word primary the you know the the definition of word primary and utility in this question is mm. a primary utility of cinema well i guess that's kind of uh, you know who are you asking are you asking joe schmo in the cinema who's sitting there with his popcorn are you asking the the artist who created it and i think that yeah. a lot of a lot of directors and producers and actors would say that they're not there to entertain you and they are um they're trying to move your heart to open up your worldview and that they the you know, entertainment is just the the vehicle that gets that gets its way um to you know to, to, to doing that if you were a director looking to get funding for your movie you, it would be a real impediment if your name was actually Joe Schmo. I feel like any, <laughs> any investor would be immediately suspicious of the quality. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I, I guess in order to answer this question, we have to define primary utility one way or the other. 
So, okay. I, okay. so which I, is the I more interesting to, direction to go here? I think I'm going to come down on, yes, entertainment is the primary utility of cinema, but it is not the only utility of cinema, and it's not the ultimate aim of cinema. Hmm. Okay, I suppose utility is like, what is it for? And that yeah. probably is, yeah, it is accurate that that's um, in terms of how is it benefiting society. I think it might be its utility. Mm. Oh, now I'm not, now I'm not sure. Utility is sort of but, you know the usefulness of it, and yeah. so yeah, no, I think you know to be to take it into another direction. I think mm. the way that most people consume film. I don't know if you wrote the word cinema there to trip me you know, specifically, but cinema. No, I think I, is sort of. I think a film and cinema is the same, personally. Okay, okay. So I think that most films, on you know, in aggregate, are there for entertainment. You could say profit is the primary utility of cinema, almost. But I think entertainment <laughs> is the um, the metric by which films either live or die. Uh, you know that, and the uh, music, of course, and hmm. <laughs> that the um, there's probably a very few number of uh, a very small number of creators directors, writers who are writing stuff that is valuable beyond the entertainment. Uh, so I'd say that uh, although that's what I would consider the most important part of film, you know, the entertainment is also very important and that's probably the only thing that actually matters to most people. Hmm. I guess uh, if you removed cinema from the planet, from, from history as a concept, um, what would change? Well, I think we're on the cusp of that. If you, uh, mm. if we see more people are consuming videos in very short forms, yeah, it's either you know, forty second videos or it's or it's three hour video essays on YouTube that you you have on while you're going for a bike ride or, or washing dishes. And I think we we may soon see a a, gr a great diminishing of um, of cinema. And we may we may well find that the the few remaining uh, directors for film are the true artists who really love the medium of film and aren't just there to to entertain. But um, yeah, I think the, the 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 product that cinema is serving to the masses is entertainment. It's distraction. It's catharsis, pathos. You know that um, it, it's the it's the chemicals that it makes in your brain when you're sitting there in the cinema. And what we're finding mm. out is that we've all got the, the little cinema in our pocket, and you can mm -hmm. you can deliver the same feeling and extract the same amount of money with a Netflix miniseries. <laughs> so mm. uh, so why even have a cinema? <laughs> what do you think of the Martin Scorsese line that Marvel films are not even cinema? The closest thing that they are is a roller coaster ride. The, the, the experience of going to see cinema is not just the um, moving pictures and the sound, but it's actually a, a lineage of a certain filmic language, a set of intentions, a, a kind of elevated culture. Um, and by that definition, that you know to distinguish cinema from just e like anything that could happen to you in a room that has a screen and speakers in it <laughs> that that cinema actually points to something uh that that has a certain power and a certain philosophy behind it and, a, and an artistic intent um partly there, I, I guess i should say uh because um i've totally failed to plug any of my other projects over the course of the gauntlet <laughs> but one of the things i'm doing for lamps well it's yes it's because i care for my audience and their their time <laughs> is the reason <laughs> not because i've been forgetful uh, but one of the things i'm doing for lamster this year that will come out as the grand finale of lamster after all of the gauntlet episodes have aired is this audio play called ascension and it's not I guess it's not really cinema because it's primarily intended as something that you listen to, although I'll be putting 
putting increasing amounts of effort into what will be appearing visually, um, including potentially a contribution from from yourself, uh, which I guess uh, we we haven't figured out yet. So I should yeah, yeah, TBD. I, should, I shouldn't no, announce. It's on the, but... the balls in my court, but... <laughs> Well, anyway, you you, you are um, one of my many excellent contributors who are taking part in this multimedia artistic creative project that's very high effort awesome thing that we're all working on together um and i like to think that the people who watch it will will not have a fleeting experience as you implied with with entertainment being something that just passes time and like brings us all closer to the grave <laughs> like i i have actual <laughs> you know themes that i want to explore there are um there are deep emotional uh connections that i want to make between the people watching it that, that they all recognize these human experiences and feel like they are drawn together by it um so i i guess uh I guess that's my kind of plea to, <laughs> I, I don't know, to you, to uh, the world, that cinema should be more than just entertainment. That the, There is a real significance and importance to the arts that, that almost, I'd, I almost feel like it makes, it, it gives meaning to a lot of the rest of the striving that's involved in living. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a good way to put it, and and I think you've said um, said a lot there that's um, interesting to think about. Although I think ultimately, what um, what it comes down to in terms of the debate is whether we're calling cinema all film media, you know, pictures and and sound put together, mm -hmm. or whether mm -hmm. we're talking about you know is all cinema art, is all cinematic film cinema. And uh, yes, yeah, I think I think the one key difference that I, I think of sometimes when I've read a really good book or a really good film is that it, um, it 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 changes the way I think about my day to day life. You know, I'll I'll be you know mm. having a conversation or washing you know washing some clothes, and I'll think you know it it kind of recontextualizes my life or mm. you know the way that I think about people, the way that I think about things. In, in a lasting mm. way that it wasn't even directly there, like shouted at you, like a message, you know, like help poor people, <laughs> you know, something, uh, you know, slavery was bad, <laughs> but really uh, <laughs> gives a kind of a new flavor to your life from then on. And maybe that's asking too much, but I think that that, that is yeah. the, uh, what I hope I can uh, get from Ascension. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hoping well, for when we sit down in the cinema, right, is that, <laughs> That we're going to have a you know a real human moment there that will that will stick with us. If viewers wish to watch Ascension as soon as it comes out, the best thing they can do is look in the description and find the link to my new channel Lambda Media, and uh, go and subscribe there and ring the bell and all the other cringe things that you have to do these days just to. <laughs> Just to make yeah. sure that something that matters to you doesn't uh, fall between the digital cracks. Mm -hmm. uh, right, I'm going to give you 14 points for that round, oh, cool. even though I'm not really sure which side <laughs> you ended up. Yeah, going I mean, down. It, you know, it depends on how you define the cinema. <laughs> <laughs> uh, psychology, elite theory, or theology? Oh, psychology, obviously. Ah, good. Right, mental. We're we're on uh, solid ground here. I think this is this is the. Uh, would you would you say there's a topic that you've come that you cover the most on your channel? I think because I feel like psychology does feature a lot. Yeah, it comes down to evo psych. It comes down mm. to um, you know anthropology. Well, mm. I don't really call it that. Yeah, I, I use I use this mental model all the time of thinking about like you take yourself out of your con of the context of your life and put yourself in a um, you know in Africa six million years ago no six million years ago is too long one million years ago 
Uh-huh. Um, where you're living in a you know a cave among people, like what is the uh, what is the analogy for the situation that you're in, and uh, right. that helps me that helps to guide me understanding human behavior a lot. Or maybe I'm just uh, you know making stuff up, but it, you know, I, I, I think it helps. I, I like to think people uh, living in caves in Africa a million years ago were doing the opposite. They were they were thinking. Why, when I'm running from a predator, does my heartbeat increase so high? That's probably a cortisol adrenaline response that uh, is designed so that I can keep on top of my emails <laughs> in, in a million years. <laughs> my body is preparing for a future office job that I, I'm not yet inhabiting. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, mental health issues must be destigmatized. Free will is an illusion, or dreams offer significant insights into our subconscious i i want to be slightly controversial and take dreams because mm. i think freud has had a bad uh, has a bad time of it in in modern psychology because he had a few things that sounded kind of weird and sexual and yeah you know, things that make us feel uncomfortable and <laughs> and mm. I, I think a lot of things that were just incorrect but I think that his insight into subconscious and the way that our our dreams speak to us, um, you know, the, the, it is um, it was very valuable contribution to psychology. Um, I don't know if it's useful as a psychoanalytic tool, but I I think that dreams are. I, I kind of think of it like, what is your brain doing when you when you remove the the input right like you're like what is your brain like if you're on you're on a treadmill all day doing all your things and then when you go to sleep you take away the treadmill but your legs keep going and mm. it gives you an insight to what you what was your brain doing that day all day mm. yeah if you remove the context of what you were doing what your body was doing and who was talking to you and all that i think when you have dreams especially when you remember those dreams that you um, that you do have an insight into your um, in your subconscious. I don't know if you can predict the future. I don't know if you can make a really long term insight into someone's um, life or their experiences. Um, I, I think maybe we've taken it too far, but I think that it's the you know your dreams are the the problems that your brain is trying to figure out during the day, and it's continuing. You know, it's so um, they're, they're so concerning to your brain that you keep going at it while you're while you're asleep because you haven't quite figured it out yet. Did you know uh, in, in neural networks that we build to go back to AI, you can make them dream, which is to say, so suppose you uh, suppose you build a neural network that's designed to identify handwritten characters. If you pick a given, so like the letter a you can just tell the neural network to wander around in its multi-dimensional space in the groove that it finds itself and it will it will hallucinate or dream about the letter a and all the all the various freaky shapes that the letter a could could like smoothly transform into as it as it wanders through this uh this this crazy have, have space. people doing that on Twitter where they let their uh, they let their predictive text do it have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, so which is more I don't know. What happens is that you um you know the challenge is type in I really want a and then let your predictive <laughs> text write a sentence. <laughs> or you know, I think one of them was like let Joe Biden let your predictive text write a Joe Biden speech, or you just uh you know, you start off with like what this country needs is, and then just keep uh, predicting words. You, You're right there, Luke. You, You're kind of frozen. Am I? Oh, no, you, were you, still, you were just still. It's okay. Do, 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 which, which one do you pick? Left, middle, or right for on the predictive? Middle, middle. Okay, so Who I really want a good one with the guy <laughs> or the <laughs> gal. <laughs> this has gone very modern. And the other is empty. Uh, no, it's turned into nonsense. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it turns into nonsense. Well, really, well, if you keep going for like a hundred words, what happens is that it'll come 
like full circle into like a circle of nonsense. Oh. We talk, that's what made me think when you were talking about like getting into a groove where you'll get into a circle of words that are all kind of related mm. and it'll just be a sentence that never stops because it never ends yeah. the sentence. <laughs> so it, which, which gives you more insight into a person, the predictive text <laughs> results or their dreams. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I yeah, guess it's, it's a question the... of what's the real <laughs> true person. Is it their inner life? What's going on in their brain or what they're saying to uh, the world? Yeah. Who who knows more about you, you or Google? Is ah. another another deep question. I thought you were going to say you or your best friend. You or your you or your phone. Which yeah, who, is, who has a best friend these days? days. Best friend, yeah. <laughs> Very two thousand and one of you. Mm. So so, do you think that because I I, I guess to just to go back to the evo psych thing that you you mentioned earlier because i feel quite split here that um on the one hand i've noticed that the conclusions of ev evolutionary psychology seem to be pretty deep and predictive and match up to reality well um but i'm also aware that they kind of exist within this um, entirely materialist framework. So, so dreams is a good example, right? The way that you're talking about it is a hundred percent that it's a um, an explicable phenomenon that a brain would do if it was evolved over millions of years. Uh, but that was yeah, not I mean, only, really only the way Freud that, was thinking about it. Oh, that's true. Only in the sense that consciousness is an explainable phenomenon. It's not like we understand it or where it comes from, but we do kind of know how it does what it, we, we can make predictions about how it behaves and what, what people will do, what they will think mm. in a way. It's not that we know what consciousness is, you know, this is Sam Harris always going on about, you know, being extremely mysterious, neurologically speaking. Anyway, so, uh -huh. sorry I interrupted you. I'm just, I, I want to make that no, distinction, no. but it's, it's not that we like know what a dream is on the atomic level. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't go that materialist. I, w I wouldn't give myself that many um, accolades. <laughs> uh, well, is the are you saying that we don't know because it's too deep and difficult of a question? But there is a materialist answer if if we could get there. Um, or so. So is the, I guess is this is an epistemological limit, or mm -hmm. is it? You're are actually saying that um, there might be more going on. So, for for example, there are dreams mentioned in the Bible, right? That are clearly visions from God that do have predictive power into the future. Um, do you do you hold that possibility open that there could be like genuinely non-materialist? forces at play in 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 the universe i realize this is a this is a deep <laughs> and non-relevant question to no the topic, i actually but, was uh, going to say that before you brought it up so uh i'm glad you did because i i know you want to know the answer now <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah no i think you know this evo psych thing that just goes that, that pedals around in my head constantly is this um analogy that i transplant into life um mm. you know it still goes when i'm reading when i'm reading the bible when i'm reading bible stories um, you got me the children's Bible that I now read pretty much every day. <laughs> and there's, yeah, there's, uh, there's stories of, you know, Joseph having dreams and Gideon and, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, they get really useful insights in those dreams. It's like, it's like yeah. the, in, in those stories, God doesn't really like do things. He just sends dreams and they're like the mm. best dreams ever. And he gives them the but, ability to understand the dreams. Some, there's some very precise and sort of uh, falsifiable predictions in those some of those dreams. I can't yeah, say that I've ever had those experiences myself. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's, um, you know, Richard Feynman in one of his books talks about how I think he became deeply skeptical of psychoanalysis after his, you know, he talked to some psychologist friend about a dream he had about a, a snooker table mm -hmm. where he was um, in the dream, he was trying to pot three um three balls and he he potted the red one and he potted the yellow one but he couldn't pot the gray one after a um 
oh, you know, Richard Feynman was a bit of a, a playboy. He uh, he liked his lady company, and he said that these ladies wearing these colours in his real life, not that he was predicting the future, but that he, his dream very easily transplanted onto this experience he'd had with three women during that uh, that day or that week. Um, so, so you can kind of imagine if you did have this, you know, that kind of thing, if it happened the next day, instead of that day, you, you'd think this is divine intervention uh, almost. I, I guess... Or self-sabotage. Yeah, I guess that, that sort of analysis is all always seems like uh, humans are very bad at statistics, right? We constantly attribute to luck what could probably be explained by like large the law of large numbers and uh, mm. the gambler's mm. fallacy and all that. We're, we're, we're pa pattern recognizing <laughs> engines. Yeah. So when we experience something in our dreams we are then on hyper alert potentially to find it if, if we believe yeah. that it could be prophetic we're prepared to match it onto whatever whatever crazy rotation we have to do on the idea to make it then match onto our yeah, lives yeah, yeah. i think we really we really like that idea of our dreams coming true as well mm. so we're just yeah it's expecting that to happen but i think the mm. um I mean, I don't know. The, the stories from the Old Testament are so ancient. I've got this very... Uh, I, I found John Peterson's lectures about the Old Testament to be very persuasive in the sense that I think that if those men really did exist, and they may have historically, I think they probably were very intelligent. They could see things that other people couldn't see. And they made very good decisions because of that. And mm. you know, you, it's in a story. It's easier to say he had a dream that it would happen than to say he made. You know, Joseph, while he was in the court of the pharaoh, made some really canny predictions um, because he b because he was good at recognizing patterns, and yeah. maybe he was lucky as well. You know, uh, I, I, I know that's I, not the answer you uh, probably wanted to hear, but that's. Uh, I think that okay. makes it really interesting to read those stories, thinking about like. You know, what if Gideon was just a really, um, a really savvy commander? You know, am I thinking of Gideon? Mm. I think I am. Yeah, he was one. He was one of the more effective judges, if I remember correctly. Um, mm. so, well, yeah, I'm. I'm. I, I, I'm very uh, intrigued by Jordan Peterson, and I think this has been the experience of a lot of Christians that. Um, they don't quite know what to make of his take because you might remember at the beginning of his lectures in on Genesis, he made it quite clear that he was only talking about the stories from the perspective of a psychologist. And, and he wasn't intending this to be in competition with other takes, like a, a scientific take or a a religious take or you know he, he was saying well here, here or a historical take here are these texts everybody's got their own lens this is my lens and i think that if you read these stories from a psychological perspective you you get all these kind of insights um and the stuff that he the stuff that he kind of uncovered from the text was like beautifully poetic and had a flavor of kind of the self-help section of a bookshop, right? That uh, you could listen to Jordan Peterson and then apply his idea. He, he would back it up. So here is a, a reading of the text. And also here are some scientific papers. And if you take all these things together, here's a really practical thing that you can do in your life. And here's some, here's a really grand vision of the significance of what I'm telling you. That was, th those were the, the flavors I remember from those early Jordan Peterson lectures that just went wildly viral. And I, I think, I think this is kind of fulfilling in a way, a lot of what, do you remember there, was, there were those atheist churches that 
uh, <laughs> popped up. This was like just before Atheism Plus. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I only heard about them when I talked to Paul Vanderclay. Uh -huh. He said that there were these secular churches, and they sounded extremely cringe, actually. <laughs> Paul Vanderclay, by the way, everyone should go and um, tweet at him because uh, I've still failed to convince him <laughs> to come on my channel. <laughs> every, it feels like every time I talk to you, you say that. <laughs> yeah, I've got a real beer by bonnet about PVK. <laughs> so, sorry, before we, uh, before we go any further, I, I, I wanted to say what... Um, just came to mind talking about Jordan Peterson and um, and his different perspectives on on Genesis. I don't know if you've watched his Exodus series with Dennis Prager yeah, and various other conversations scholars and intellectuals. Yeah, so something really interesting if you watch those is that Jordan Peterson does his like psychology thing, like his um, yeah, it, what do you call it? The subconscious, the the Jungian right. collective, yeah. the collective subconscious thing. And he goes, yeah, well, it's so interesting. Like, you, <laughs> well, think about it. And then, <laughs> and then Janet Frank is like, no, but it did actually happen. Like, this isn't a metaphor. <laughs> did, yeah. You know, yeah, we made was... lessons from it, but it did happen, like, just to be clear. <laughs> I th I thought that was really interesting watching that for exactly that reason that it was partly Dennis Prager but I th I actually thought there was another guy I can't remember his name who was even more dogged about this that um it, in some ways I felt like was doing the same thing that I would have probably done if I was in that situation which is um that's that's lovely Jordan <laughs> but you, you're kind of um <laughs> You're you're kind of uh, being obscure and fancy without having like talked about the base, the the obvious like level. But it, it, I kind of feel like it's more exciting in a way to, to do the Jordan Peterson thing with the Bible. It's it's more fun to the more rock and roll yeah to be hyper intellectual and super deep and and poetic about it um and i feel like a little bit of the grinch showing up and being like okay jordan <laughs> but like in addition to your <laughs> lens of being a a psychologist what do you what do you think about it as a like a person as a human you know th this is a a text that is written to to human beings and 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 kind of like ad addresses you as a and w when uh this has happened like so many times that it's got a bit boring now but um christians will say to jordan peterson uh you know a fairly sort of blunt question uh, along the lines of do you believe in god do you believe in jesus so you know oh, you're so, something be a catholic that was the latest yeah. one <laughs> right like what which, which is kind of trying to, which is trying to nail him down well that's probably a poor mm. choice of words <laughs> yeah, do you believe my, my, in the yeah the right. resurrection jordan <laughs> <laughs> and he gets really annoyed because he's like don't you know that i've got a great thing going here where all the christians think that i'm a christian and all the atheists think that i'm an atheist <laughs> and i can get money from both <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like please don't make me answer this this question but I'm not sure on a deeper analysis whether the purely psychological view is actually more exciting. I know it, in in those interactions, Peterson always is able to spin his 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 amazing rhetorical style makes what he's saying seem more appealing, but. It does fundamentally, I think, rob the stories of the actual spiritual, magical, amazing, supernatural quality. And it it becomes this kind of uh, dry materialist text where it's just talking about, okay, fine, so yeah, snakes are scary, and if you want to avoid snakes, you should... <laughs> you know do good things and if you if you act you know if you follow the rules then you you know in some symbolic way we get to it's like a everything becomes a 
Red Riding Hood story. Do you What's see what I mean? Story that... in the Bible. <laughs> uh, From a ch- purely well, I, entertainment perspective, I I I do genuinely love all the parables because they function to me like little puzzles that you have to um, solve. So to but go to, go doing, to our previous, you're not re- doing it. You're not doing it the Jordan <laughs> Peterson way. You're doing it like Wh- a, in a different way. Which, which well, you mean if I which story would I like to take apart in a petersonian way the most no no i want to know what's the story that's got the most well what what, what inspires you you know which figure from the bible really makes you um want to emulate them or want to um just read it again because you love it the i i think it's it's hard to argue on a pure like the stuff that happens is so awesome and and compelling and and it just like flies by chapter after chapter of of like scintillating stuff the story of joseph is pretty good right yeah 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 definitely you, you know, i mean it, it's been probably the most adapted other than the story of jesus yeah. right like the uh yeah multicolored dream coat and uh, all that i don't know if joseph is the person who i most want to emulate I mean, apart from jesus is the obvious person there i've heard people say that the 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 only person of whom it could be said that he never does anything wrong is Daniel, um, mm. who yeah, Daniel's good, is a very interesting story. Ca- character. It's prob- probably Daniel is more uh, is is more exciting for a for a kind of from a dissident perspective because <laughs> he like faces off against the secular power in a rebellious way. So for for people who want to be a bit more dissident then Dan- daniel is quite exciting um and also there's a few chapters of narrative in daniel and then it goes wildly off the rails and turns into apocalyptic literature which everyone loves you know it's like reading it's like reading the silmarillion to <laughs> revelation which is the lord of the rings <laughs> yeah 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 it's, it's like That's you can good. unlock some of the later apocalyptic stuff um anyway what, what were we what were we originally talking about yeah, sorry, i put you off uh, I, I put you off track with the with that question but i well, really wanted to know well p- picking up on joseph and daniel for yeah dr- dreams is like quite interesting because obviously as you i think you mentioned joseph potentially could just be a genius um yeah. although uh the interpretation of the dreams is a little bit I, I don't know why Pharaoh is so convinced by his by Joseph's interpretation before all the events happen because <laughs> you know Well maybe he was very persuasive, you know, he you know if right. you say if you come to the Pharaoh and you say, I had a dream that there's yeah. going to be te- seven years of famine, I think that's actually less convincing than if <laughs> he came to the Pharaoh with a like a, a four thousand word essay to say these are the things I've observed happening mm. and this is the reason why this is going to lead to fam- I mean I know the famines are very um, kind of spontaneous in the sense that they're led by um you know droughts uh you know the ash clouds famously can you know the, the sunlight all those things can cause massive instability in food sources mm. um so th- that does sort of s- sound like divine in- inspiration but I think equally he could have just been predicting that you know, if, if you're not preparing for a famine, like what is your plan? You're just going to have a famine, you know, like, oh yeah, maybe there'll be a famine or maybe there won't, but we're not going to do anything about it. Like that just sounds on his face like silly. So maybe we should prepare for one Pharaoh. <laughs> yeah. So, so Joseph foresees that there will be seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. And his suggestion mm. is, during the during the plenty, while we have loads of extra stuff, we ought to store some of it. And then the results of this is that during the following seven years of famine, bearing in mind that in the ancient world, Egypt was like the breadbasket. It was such a fertile place that uh, drought drought just basically was the entire human race was starving. And this enabled Pharaoh to acquire 
masses of property. This is like the 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 least this is the ancap nightmare because joseph enables the egyptian state to own like massive percentages of land of of like cattle which you know joseph is praised for and is at the at the head of so in my libertarian days this was this was a great problem to me this story <laughs> Um, but then there's a, there's a par to go back to Jesus' parables in the New Testament. He tells a parable about a guy who has uh, a bumper crop with his harvest, and he builds barns, and then he tears down his barns and builds bigger barns. Sounds like very much the same thing that Joseph was advocating for and was praised for. And then in the parable in the New Testament, the next thing that happens is that that night the rich man dies and god says to him uh you you fool <laughs> you know you you fool this night your soul will be demanded of you and instead of being uh you know rich towards your future you should have been rich towards god so interesting to hold those two stories in intention mm. yeah i think it's i think the, the bible does present these counter narratives that um you know the, in some situations you've got you know you've got to have a bit of nuance you know in, in probably most situations in fact well i um, i'm just not sure what the takeaway from joseph would be I mean, did peterson ever get around to joseph i mean he must have if he, he got have, to yeah. if got he got to, to the exodus the book, didn't he? then he must yeah. you know, maybe he skipped some he didn't think it was yeah. worth it I mean, I think it's interesting that the pharaoh had the dream. I just remembered that it's um it's pharaoh's mm. dream about the skinny cows Sweet. and the fat cows. So it kind yeah. of suggests to me that the pharaoh knows what's going to happen. His subconscious but knows. But he doesn't hold the interpretation, which is interesting. In the New Testament, there's a bit of discussion about prophecy because it seems like in the early church there was so there were certain churches in which if you showed up you'd just hear loads of people babbling in random languages and nobody knew what anyone else was saying which was not not particularly good situation and one of the rules they put down was that if you are going to give a word of prophecy in a church you have to make sure that there's somebody around who can interpret um so yeah this I mean, is all think... stuff that's quite relevant in the more charismatic churches, whereas the more traditional churches that I've tended to go to, um, you, you know, for one reason or another, and it, you know, leave it to, leave it to each church to explain why, um, they don't see a great deal of prophecy and speaking in tongues and mm. healing people happening. Yeah, that's odd. No, I think. Um... If you if I think interpreting Joseph as a as a secular story to come back to that, yeah. I um I, th I think it is yeah, to, to bring it to to prayer. I um you know I I started to pray when I heard people talk about what it's like to pray about something that's really troubling you. You know what mm -hmm. am I going to do about this problem? Like it seems insurmountable. I don't know. You know I have this decision coming up, or I have um you know I have this difficulty. And mm. to to pray about it and to receive an answer, I think um, it gives a lot of certainty in that answer. And what I found when trying it myself um, is that it's sort of, you know, you get the answer back that you, you know, I don't believe it's coming from somewhere else, but you knew what you had to do. You know, Pharaoh knew that he had to be saving up his crops, but he needed the certainty behind that to do it. He mm. needed to have the faith that it would pay off you know i think when you when you know the right thing to do um then it can it can be scary because it's not always the easiest thing to do but if you pray and you really put aside you know what do i have to gain from this like put aside your kind of lower impulses and really think about what is best for my life like what is the correct way to act now in this situation mm. then i think the the answer does come to you and you know you might even think of a few ways to make it possible you know the way that joseph uh, helped pharaoh to do and so i think um you know joseph interpreting pharaoh's dream you know pharaoh accepts the interpretation from this 
prisoner, like why would he accept that? Because the <laughs> prisoner, like he says something extremely wise, and the pharaoh knows it's wise because he knew it already. You know, he how do you know something's wise if you you know if you, if you if you've never thought of it before? Well, mm. you know, you've you might have been hearing it phrased that way for the first time, but it kind of I, I think it's when you hear someone saying something very wise or intelligent, it rings true with something you experienced already or something that you know already in a um, in a different form and putting that into mm. words. And I think that's what Joseph did for Pharaoh. And I think that's what religion does for, for people in general. Yeah. I, I just think of um, Jesus saying that on the last day, many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy and heal and cast out demons in your name? And, and he will say to them, away from me, you evildoers, I never knew you. I, I guess that's, that, that's kind of my feeling as a Christian on this perspective of religion, because I... I can kind of run the mental simulation of how would I think if I was an atheist? I, I, I hope that's not a um, <clears throat> condescending thing to say, because I, I think I would, I, you know, I would probably run the same counter simulation if I was an atheist of like, how would a religious person feel? Um, mm. So I, can, I can kind of, I think I can fully enter into that Petersonian, uh, viewpoint on religion and and view it as useful as a kind of hack on biology like <laughs> this is you this make it is sound the so way cheap. That, yeah this is this is the way that we can function best as a society is if we have all of these false beliefs that construct a kind of group behavior that has these emergent properties and all that. Well, like it depends on what you mean by true doesn't it <laughs> <laughs> i've listened to enough of peterson that i kind of i can see how he thinks about these things and well and there's those interesting moments where he kind of you can feel him a, like there there is a big dark cloud of unknown that he's kind of approaching where he's he's more open to like he talked like um when he talks about jesus being p the potential moment where the genuinely divine or no how does he talk about it oh it's like um the the mythic world of archetypes that he's so obsess obsessed with actually comes into contact with with history um, I think those are the, and he's quite emotional when he is talking in those terms. And I think that's the closest he gets to a contemplation of a reality that's beyond the materialistic. But there's kind of, I, I just think um, the, yeah the risk of the petersonian perspective on religion is that it's uh an interpretation of the world where you see the real deal of spiritual things happening and then you cover it over with the blanket of uh this is a this is an emergent property or a do you, do you see what i'm saying that there's kind of a um there's kind of a boxing like dodging and weaving that happens where you like but, but what about is god real oh but i don't what what do you even mean by god <laughs> you know the, yeah. the, no, the, there's a the, there's a reason that christians want to ask the question and it's not because they're trying to catch him out or capture him or have him for a political purpose. It's because he obviously has a position on these questions. <laughs> He's just not prepared to say it because the 
um, like the conclusion that he's reached is to um, uh, divisive for his audience. I, I at least that's my interpretation, right? That if he was to come out and say, "I don't believe in Christianity," in I I think of it as uh, some kind of uh, sort of pr primitive belief system that kind of captures a materialistic wisdom. Um, but a lot of the things that it its adherents believe are just flat out wrong. Um, mm -hmm. he, I guess he the, would... the analogy would be that um, yeah, if you if we look at ancient civilizations and their hygiene practices, mm -hmm. they came up with rules and even the you know, parts of religion, you know, kosher and um, halal, that were, um, from atheist perspectives, very much hygiene-based rules on mm -hmm. eating. You know, the, the, these ideas of sort of um, what is holy to eat and what is unholy to a modern uh, viewer just look like practical advice on how to stop stop consuming microbes that will do you harm and make you sick mm -hmm. um so you can just say well that's that's all it is yeah th this was just a, an ancient people you know th th there was no holy and unholy or sacred and unsacred there was only microbes <laughs> and i guess <laughs> the uh you know what jordan peterson is like saying is that um you know the, the microbes were always real they just called them something else so mm -hmm. if you say like well is um is halal neat um no, har no halal means good Hal haram means bad. haram yeah haram um you know is the uh you know is eating pork evil well it's it, that was the best way they had to call it evil but now we know about microbes we can eat pork without that fear. I can't remember what point I was aiming at now, but I think that's well, what Jordan Peterson is saying is that um like yeah. for those people who didn't know what microbes were, they needed a word for microbes. <laughs> and that doesn't mean that microbes aren't real just because they used to call them something else. The thing that they called yeah. it evil, like evil spirits or whatever I, that sounds like quite offensive to people who probably observe halal and all, but uh, whatever it is that yeah, the, the word haram is right. just their word for bad microbes. <laughs> Yeah, but but I guess the, the the interesting thing to me is um, that so there's two competing hypotheses maybe about uh, what is the um, what is the truth behind these religious texts. I suppose a third hypothesis might be the religious texts are useless and we should just discard them but, but like i guess amongst the people who think that they've got value and really should be taken seriously half the people think that's because they describe um things in a fairly straightforward way that the modern mind rejects but that the scriptures are actually correct and then the the other school of thought is that the um, the scriptures describe things that the modern mind can actually see with greater clarity, and ancient people had a sort of clouded view where they thought the scriptures were saying something that they weren't quite. So I, I guess the the question that like. To, to boil it down being that did the initial readers or the original writers talk in plain language like fairly straightforward language and describe things accurately or did they sort of stumble into or encapsulate something quite complicated that we've only just managed to properly understand and and pick apart but they did it in a way that had mimetic power and that had um, a certain social force. So th these two schools, and I think you can, I, th I think you can see that the view that the 
ancient people were kind of correct is seen as the the less academic impressive interesting hypothesis and the the like oh well if if it's really describing microbes that's the more interesting perspective but i i don't think in my mind that is actually accurate like i i think the the claim that the scriptures are talking straightforwardly is actually the more exciting and interesting one to me and i, I don't know why there's this I, I i guess i'm trying to pick apart like what is it about the the petersonian or the i guess yeah there's, there's there must be other names that i could use <laughs> instead of <laughs> just secular, repeatedly the, uh, yeah the, the secular interpretation because you could say it the other way around, right? It, you could so look at um, sexuality. You could say that there was an, um, you know, a, a dimly understood concept of genetics that led people to say you shouldn't sleep, you shouldn't have incest of various sorts, um, and. And the, the real deep thing that was going on was we need to prevent inbreeding because that leads to these various types of disease. You could go the other way around and say that actually there's stuff built into our biology that teaches us about holiness and about um, the important, like sex, for example, is actually something that God put into the species so that we can understand about the um you know the 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 love between god and the church is like the love between a husband mm -hmm. and a wife or, and um or, you know there's this i think really exciting way of doing the same subversion but in reverse where you go mm -hmm. from the I think I get what you're saying. Can low... I try and rephrase it so that I can see if I've got yes. it? Yes. I realize I've been monologuing for like 10 minutes, so apologies. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean I'm trying to I'm trying to understand it. Um and I think uh yeah, well people people use this phrase kind of sneeringly to say, like, oh, you think it's ontologically evil, you know, like mm. to believe that some things are actually sacred and mm -hmm. some things are actually haram or or just bad and that you know that before uh, the first human being set foot on the planet this was bad mm -hmm. and it always will be bad because we live in god's creation and some things do glory to god and some things uh, you know are upsetting to god and it, it doesn't matter how efficacious it is to us or whether it's genetically beneficial um but that that we as we do science and find out more about the world and about microbes we're only finding out more ways in which these things were correct you know that's uh, oh that's that's why god made sex so fun and pleasurable it's not mm -hmm. because um you know not because <coughs> of, uh I, I don't know um not for like the the basic the the kind of in my mind entry level child grade understanding is propagation of the species we make sex a, 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 a attractive and pleasurable yeah, thing yeah. because otherwise you wouldn't bother to do it and then you don't have children and so that that's yeah. the like the entry yeah. to me the, that's but, the boring okay, but, explanation <laughs> but i think what you're saying is that because it is good and because god likes it that's why he rewards people who have the let's say the correct sex that's why they have the most fun and that's why they have the most children. Well, I don't know if that is exactly the direction I would drive okay. that in. I, all right, all right. I, I, I kind of see what you're saying. Um, I thought I was, I, I was trying to say what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm interested that um, it's not bang on the direction that I was heading. And I don't know if that communicates that I haven't explained myself well enough or or so or maybe it's just because of my i think my takes I, are I a little arbitrary it sounds but, like uh, you're right but i also i'm well, just having a difficult time yeah um, i, I, I the, guess I re guess the, rephrasing it 
Sure. So, okay, what you're pointing to is that there's these interesting discoveries that, like, actually the people who have the most sex are married couples and that actually having lots of children is a real blessing and it seems to only happen to people who are fairly, like, put together. And all these kind of, like, the righteous people are are rewarded in mm-hmm. this life. So, so, th- so that's an interesting direction to look in and there's some interesting stuff in proverbs yeah, it's almost like you've taken the same correlation um where you say like oh it ha- just so happens that the thing god recommends is actually good for you yeah um, but instead you're just turning that backwards and saying but, well that maybe that's why he recommended it <laughs> or, right uh, but i don't know maybe I, that's i don't know i think the the like elevated perspective so so i guess entry level is evo psych this is what i this i want to like redraw everyone's got this view of like the childish dimension is yeah. the religious view and then evo psych yeah. is the like elevated version i want to flip well, that upside you, down, know, so. you know jesus said uh you know th- th- those who will be first in heaven will be the ones who come to me as children <laughs> is that uh yeah or interesting children, i should say so then the yeah, the, the people. It's, it's more like the bell. Are you saying it's more like the bell curve? Where... <laughs> right, it's, it's the Evo psych in the middle. No, you've got my, you've got fair. my, you've got my five-year-old daughter who really likes the Bible stories, and she's got the same At the opinion bottom, as yeah. the uh, hyper-intellectual as the... Uh, Paul Van der Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, exactly. No, so and then I'm, the... I'm the midwit bell in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> you and Jordan Peterson, yeah, so... yeah. <laughs> no, the elevated view of of sex, right, as an example, as an exemplar of this kind of broader pattern. But I, I'd say the the kind of really interesting insight is that w- when uh, at last you know the day of judgment happens and the people who are described as the church you know god's people just the 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 ones who will enter into the new creation um and live forever in you know in perfect harmony with god they are described as the bridegroom dressed up beautifully um and christ is described as as the groom sorry i got that the wrong way around church is the bride jesus is the bridegroom um and then you say oh interesting so all the stuff that we were taught about how men and women should live together in marriage such as the husband should love his wife to the point of giving himself up for her you discover oh that seems really natural to us because as a husband you do have this impulse that you love your wife and you would give yourself up for her and now we understand we have some insight into why jesus was driven to give himself up for the church um and and so the the fact that sex is this monumentally like important thing in human psychology where we are like obsessed with it and our whole culture revolves around sex and it's this it's like totemic thing of like pleasure is then actually a reflection of of the centrality of marriage as a symbol as a as a picture of church and christ united and how significant and enjoyable and fulfilling and like totalizing that finality will be so it's nothing to do with this world and the success that people can find and the you know the way a, a lot of this stuff about religion being functional i guess it's a bit like we were just talking about what's the utility of cinema right <laughs> what's the utility of religion and i i fundamentally think all of the sort of 
benefits that you see in Christianity are kind of um, small potatoes. They're like the the side dish <laughs> to what actually matters. Um, there's there's okay. um Again, there's a I, quote. I can, have another, can I have another go? Yeah, please. Sure. So I uh, yeah I was on the Lotus Eaters. Thank you very much. And <laughs> I, we uh, Dan you, put up you, the allegory. Sorry. You, you followed me to the Lotus Eaters. You were there a week after me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was on your coattails. <laughs> um, and Dan put up the uh, you know the analogy of the um, you know Plato's cave. And uh, yeah, I mean, I've yeah. seen, I, you know, I know of it. I did uh, a level philosophy, mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I think this uh, this analogy of the cave is really useful because it kind of just means all things to all people. But I kind of think <laughs> of um, what you're saying. It sounds like you're talking about the cave is like <laughs> the the material world where mm -hmm. we're all living our short little lives, mm. watching the little shadow puppets on the wall, thinking this is really important. And this is all there is. And there's mm -hmm. one shadow puppet um, that we love watching called sex and pornography okay, and yeah. marriage and love yeah. and romance yeah. and all these things that, oh, what, this this shadow performance is amazing. We love the shadow. This yeah, is, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This shadow, <laughs> that's brilliant. Like, I want to watch yeah. that some more. Just yes. tell me more about this shadow. Um, right. And then, like, and then when we die or we're on the day of judgment, we find out that that shadow was actually being cast by the sun. <laughs> And yes. the sun yes. is so much more amazing than that little shadow that we saw in the cave. Yeah. Um, and that it's yeah. really um, a very different thing altogether in magnitude, but also in quality. Mm. Yes. But it, hey, yeah, I think that's so pretty good. It's so brilliant that it casts a little shadow for us to enjoy in this life while we were in the cave. There, there's this quote that you, I'm sure you've heard before from C.S. Lewis that says um it would seem that our lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak we're half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea we are far too easily pleased <laughs> so true um, about kids by the way well, <laughs> they, 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 they don't want to do anything slum. fun if they've got something moderately fun <laughs> occupying their attention now nothing will entice them to stop the uh <laughs> the moderately interesting mud pies yeah <laughs> all right well uh i feel like i thought I, i'm not entirely sure how to how to fairly score this round <laughs> that <I've laughs> that was a, dragged it on for like around behind an extra okay. 30 minutes um, so I, I'm oh, going to wow. give you 14, just, just kind of <laughs> slightly like arbitrary. It, yeah. yeah, okay. <laughs> um, All things being equal. Oh, we, we're doing yeah. another round. I thought that must be the finale. I'm sorry to say we still have two rounds to go, but I, I've just also... Just to make it fair with the, with the other contestants. Or, uh... well, exactly. Otherwise, I'd have to enter an average score or something lame like that. Um, you and your spreadsheet. I've got a... <laughs> <laughs> toil away just to to appease the can you put a little the male mind hey eh? yeah okay come on technology, technology natural sciences or christology uh, uh natural sciences please carol <laughs> this feels like we've we've been told by the substitute teacher like get back to your textbooks scientists should be asking whether they should I think this is a reference to uh instead of they, whether they can mm. quantum entanglement disproves the notion of locality in physics oh, or a unified <laughs> <laughs> or a unified theory of physics is the ultimate goal of science uh yeah i'll take a, a unified theory of physics you know i've read um i've read a brief history of time okay. and i've read uh I've read Richard Feynman. I'm trying to remember who else. This is something that I know a bit about. Before I found out that there was a really interesting science called Evo Psych, I, uh, <laughs> I did you were um, interested dabble in around with physics. Um, physics and uh, you know other things. Maths. <coughs> I really liked maths at a certain age. I think we probably did too. Hmm. Um, well, I thought I was going to do maths at uni for a while. Hmm. You know, overall, I think I wasn't that impressed with. Um, you know, once you get to a certain level, 
maths and physics, I think, uh, becomes a little bit uh, abstract from true human experience. Hmm. And, and I'm not one of those people that puts up their hand in the class and says, how is this, a, how is this going to be useful in life? <laughs> you just thought it. Yeah, but I think that um, you know a unified theory of physics is one of those things where I kind of don't really see what the big deal is. And I mm -hmm. think it's really cool that we know how particles work on a really small scale. And I think it's really cool that we know how massive stars and energy and fusion and fission, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's really kind of beautiful the way that the, you know, the inter-particular forces um, going on in particles has this massive effect on stars and, you know, that the, we have these enormous things in our universe. We also have incalculably tiny things in our universe. Um, but I don't think that there's any, um, let's say, uh, utility, maybe he's putting it too, <clears throat> too bluntly, but I, uh, I, I don't think that it's tremendously important that we have the same rules dictate the very, the very small and the very large. The fact mm. that the that physics has this big question mark around it is interesting that we see different, we see different particular for, laws of forces play out differently on the big scale and the small scale. And yet we can still have, you know, we use these different laws to make our, um, you know, our silicon chips work. Uh, we, we, we know how to use these laws properly in both contexts. <coughs> um, and so I don't think it's really that important that we find a grand unified theory, although I don't, I'm not going to stop anyone who wants to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't think it's the uh, the ultimate goal of science, and there's you know, there's yeah. other. I don't know if there is an ultimate goal of science. Really, I think that there's a lot of different reasons to do scientific research and to um, and and scientific theory. You know, I think it's really cool whatever they do. I, I don't think it needs to align with a certain one T loss that everyone is trying to get behind. Uh, mm. You know, I want to do science to like own the libs, but I think it's also <laughs> fine that there are libs out there trying to use science to prove why I need to recycle my glass bottles. <laughs> Using liberalism to own the scientists. Yeah. I, I detect that you've got a similar intuition to me, which is, I think, fundamentally the mindset of an engineer. And, <laughs> and we more or less think of science as the first step in what is basically an engineering process <laughs> like if if a scientist is important it's because they've contributed to a larger goal of building a thing and when when somebody like neil degrasse tyson stands up and claims credit as a scientist for making a the internet or a plane or whatever it's like well science was a component like a foundational stage but there were other things in addition to science that were required before this became useful to mankind so we're like we're very grateful to you neil degrasse tyson <laughs> but please stop taking credit for the entire process <laughs> because science is really just a subservient field underneath the the grand important role that uh, in innovation, invention, manufacturing, distribution, like all, mm. all of the things that actually matter, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of implementation that the scientists leave over. Do you, do you see what I mean? Yeah, I know. I also think it's the, the opposite is true, though, about um, you know, a big project like the Large Hadron Collider you know, mm. the various different scientists working on different experiments in there. Um, I think it's an amazing feat of engineering and project management and um, and even in uh, global collaboration that we have something like the LHC and that we are able to do these amazingly intricate experiments at massively high speeds with tiny, tiny particles. Uh, and I think that it's, even if they never find anything of real utility to it, um, I mean, I think that, the the scientists will take credit for the discovery of the um, you know, the Higgs boson particle uh, when really the you know of course there's a lot of credit that goes to the engineers that built every part of that large hadron collider 
and mm. you know to the uh to, to the janitor who cleaned the toilets you know and i think um to <laughs> i think if the engineer tried to take uh tried to take credit for the scientific experiment he would also be incorrect you know i think that's what you're saying is that there's lots of components in all of them um you know i think that's the i think that's the really wonderful thing about it is that it requires so many people to um mm. to figure it out i also think it's incredible when you get these genius people who come along you know every once in a while and they just figure stuff out in the in their study on their own uh -huh. with a pencil uh -huh. and pen like i think that's really cool as well and i think that the the, I think the process of hadrons science is, really... is actually an example of that right they they pr predicted hadrons entirely theoretically long before they could uh measure it I think. Uh, yeah, I'll have to take your word for that. I don't. Um, I don't think you're wrong. Um, you just don't yeah. Know. I think. I don't know. I think if really, I had to, to say that there's a, I think. Um, I think to say that there's an ultimate goal of science is a, is a mistake. When really the, um, maybe this sounds a bit too Randian, <laughs> you know, a bit too self-important. But I think that the, uh, you know, the if there is a goal of science, it's the the process of getting there. The mm. you know the. The, the fact that we are part of this grand civilization that's made that's discovered more about the universe than anyone who's come before maybe even you know we might even be alone in the universe like we are the only people ever who've discovered this truth about the world we live in and that that we had to use nothing but our own you know it was like we started uh we started a new civ, civ five game yeah yeah. with absolutely nothing like we're just these we're just these apes who walk on two legs and we found some rocks uh -huh. to to make fire and from the yeah. discovery of fire the discovery of um everything else we've you know building on each other's inventions have got to a large hadron collider experiment i think that's really cool i i wonder if um because i, I i'm interested in whether pure quest for knowledge is more or less important than other forms of human expression right so what is a um what is a what is a uh work of art so i'm going to include like cinema or theater or music or anything like that um that is of sufficient value that you would if if you had to choose to keep only one you would choose it over the observations of the deep hubble field right the the, the knowledge of the multitude of galaxies that exist outside the milky way right that's a piece of information that is awesome to know about but of zero practical significance. So I'm saying, would you know, where do you rate that in comparison to like <laughs> Mozart, for example? Would you yeah. would you sacrifice Bach <laughs> or Taylor Swift? You know. Yeah, you know, I think um, music has this evolutionary um, element where we do get people innovating on other people's innovations, so that we're not still mm. singing. Gregorian chants. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know, I wish we were, <laughs> but I think uh, I think that science has a. Um, you know, it's not quite as fun to talk about at parties, mm. but I think the the massive collaboration that's needed to make um, to make these massive engineering projects and to make these discoveries not just collaboration in you know with other people in the room, but um, you know across time collaboration. Um, I think each piece of the puzzle is important to you know it's all on a staircase of um discovery so if you took out my, my point is that if you took out taylor swift all the music that came after taylor swift might be different but i don't think it would be meaningfully worse and that's not to say that i don't <laughs> like taylor swift but it's like okay well taylor swift's influence on music um I, it's just so subjective that i think it can't be said to be good or bad and I would, yeah, I, I would, I would lose Taylor Swift in a second if it was a choice between that or the uh, Hubble telescope. <laughs> so or, I've just know, done. An... Say, 
it's easy to say that about Taylor Swift, right, and not Mozart, but I think um, the, generally the same argument could be applied to Mozart, even though yeah, he, he, I like his music more than Taylor Swift's. I've just done an interesting calculation. Okay, so the total cost of the Large Hadron Collider was 7.5 billion uh, oh, euros, and the total budget of June 2 was 190 million dollars so if you divide hang on. <laughs> are you talking about june and part june part one and two part, or are you talking about david lynch just part june? just part two so you could you could produce 36 <laughs> movies of the size of june part two no, I mean, that's not fair, is it? Or one because, large hadron collider. Because they make 35 <laughs> movies every year and none of them are as good as June. There's only one that's the quality of June every year. Like, uh, I'm very <laughs> discerning when it comes to films where I think that most most films can just go into the, the, the trash bin of history. And then yeah. a, you know, a few times a year, you'll get a really, um, a really interesting or really funny... Um, very mm. insightful, or very well crafted product. Um, but you know, I think are you June, saying June it, might be one of those? If you found thirty six random films that cost the same amount as June two, that you're not going to find two or three of them that are act actually worth watching. Yeah, well, that's what that's that, that's the job of a movie movie producer is that they put the, these millions into films and they don't even know yeah. if it's going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> until it's out there right like they have to make yeah. 36 films a year so that they can make one good one <laughs> that's but just then, the process okay let let's just make it one to one then which is a better use of money the lhc or one movie of the quality of june 2 uh yeah i think uh yeah the lhc i mean the um you know you want to talk about like moon landing or what any difference other... is Massive, what difference has the LHC yeah. made in your life? Well, I think, like, it, I think they, it made, it's, it's not about If they didn't me, actually make it's it, about if it was all... <laughs> what if it was just a big Ponzi scheme and they didn't even put the tunnel, uh, you know, underneath Sweden or wherever it is? Switzerland, I guess. Switzerland. Um, like, I would personally wouldn't even... I, I don't think it would ever affect my life if they didn't even shoot a single high-speed particle around the LHC. And that, that, attitude, gonna... it, that attitude is going to keep you in caves. <laughs> I, think, I, uh... I think we should have stayed in the caves. Uh, the whole thing has been a Ponzi <laughs> scheme, in my opinion. <laughs> oh, All right. The, uh, uh, I'll give you a score for this round. Uh, even though we disagree, I'm going to give you 12. How about that? Do you like June? D Denis yeah, Villeneuve. I... Vin we, we, sh we probably should have just talked for two hours about June. It would have been a more interesting conversation. Oh, but, uh... Maybe next time. <laughs> maybe next time. Uh, yes, I have many thoughts on June. And uh, basically, yes, is... I did enjoy it a lot. Is the book Frank Herbert's Dune in the literature section? <laughs> <laughs> I know it's cheating, but if it is... If you... uh... Well, as you've probably noticed, the topics are pretty broad. So I'm mm, sure yeah, if we pick literature, yeah. you can... You could probably. Uh, it's not going to be three in. different questions about Frank It's Herbert's not going. <laughs> Just the first it's one. Not... Yeah, it would be funny if round six I suddenly went to very specific trivia questions. <laughs> okay. I mean, similarly, you've got three categories here that I know, um, you know, I, one I know a bit about and two I don't know anything about. So uh, it's got to be. It's got to be literature. For those listening at home, it's software and mathematics and eschatology are the other. The other options so it's got to be literature that's very thoughtful for the uh listeners who don't have the screen up um and they can't appreciate your beautiful uh v your a ai artwork either <laughs> uh yes indeed uh fictional narratives have great power the traditional literary canon is overrated or translation is impossible oh that is interesting. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think uh, it, just like you know, music is the most important important part of film. I think it's just uh, self evidently true that fictional narratives have great power. So I'm uh, I'm happy to just leave it there. Uh, liter literary canon is overrated. 
is interesting. Uh, translation is impossible. Like I know where I know where you're coming from. I think I'd probably reword that to translation is difficult. Mm. Uh, maybe you need to get someone bilingual to um, to comment on that. I only know one mm. language, so I'm only kind of imagining what uh, what wonders it must be to read Murakami in Japanese. Um, but yeah, I basically agree with that. And uh, yeah, traditional but, literary, literary canon is overrated. I think we may just end up devolving into um, <coughs> a particular I, I examples think... of books we think are crap. <laughs> The um, translation is impossible. In some ways, saying it's impossible is a specific claim that uh, is almost more related to postmodernism. It's the, it's kind of the idea that, yeah. Well, do, is it is the color red the same for you? Or, you know, is the experience mm. of of life mean that when we read a text, we are we have a completely unique experience as an individual of, of that text that nobody else could ever enter into in the slightest yeah um no that's it that's a kind of interesting i, I guess it comes down to um i don't want to get stuck on talking about this one i want to take okay, the second we're one. not going to pick it do you want me to pick the second <laughs> one? If, I, if i say anything more we are we're going to talk about it anyway and then i won't get to talk about um literary canon being All overrated right. uh, uh yeah go, i think go. uh I think traditional literacy canon, literary canon, is is probably overrated. Yeah, in my opinion. I mean, how can you give how can you give a objective outlook on on literature? Yeah. I can only comment on my own personal taste and discernment. Uh -huh. And I think that many you know many members of the literary canon are very good, but I think you get um, you, you get far too much credit given to a book if people know the name of it and the author 200 <laughs> years later or 400 years later um they uh yeah they'll give it it's overrated it's not to say that it's all bad or that mm. even some of it is bad but that people rate it too highly i think is yeah i think that is true is is it true even in the wake of woke where the traditional literary canon is considered to be the work of uh um, you know, an outdated white male, a, a list of authors who are just exerting their power over us. Uh, I don't. I, you you may find some wokesters who say that, but in the um, you know th thinking about how Rob Henderson talks about luxury beliefs, I believe that the in, to the extent that woke beliefs are somewhat performative. And that people mm. are trying to increase, make themselves appear more sensitive and more ethical and more intelligent than um, th than their peers or than their lessers. Those same people, for the same reason, um, would still find it uncomfortable to say that they thought Hamlet was boring, or that you know they wouldn't say it was boring. They would say it was patriarchal, or that it was um, you know muddled, or you know. It, it was um, overrated because it was written by a white man or something. They they wouldn't. I don't think they would typically say that because it makes you just sound. But that still is like one opinion that um, that will loot like because it will cause you to decrease your perceived intelligence. Okay, sense? let's play. Let, let's play a sub game. I'll name three uh, three works that I think would be considered part of the canon. And you have to pick one to boot <laughs> that you think is a no, 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 that no, no. That's not overrated. fair. That is not fair because I didn't say they were bad. <laughs> I, I'm only arguing that they're overrated, as in okay. the typical intellectual who rates these will yeah. be they'll be forced either subconsciously or um, you know just through conscious fear of being called stupid. Mm -hmm. They'll be forced to give it a slightly higher rating than they secretly in their heart would give it. <laughs> So this is fractional. The literary canon is overrated, but only by 0.1 percent. A, a barely statistically significant. Yeah, amount. at least you know, at least 0.1 percent. But um, yeah, that, it, that would be overrated. So it counts. You know, I think some but of them without are very a literary. Overrated. Without oh really? G could you give an example of a? Th that's interesting. What's a uh, work that you think has has been vastly overrated? 
uh, James Joyce Ulysses. Oh, interesting. I maybe That's, I have to I, give it another go. You know, people. The people do you know my say my sister like, I would first. agree with you on that. She's okay. extremely well read, and I think she doesn't get on well with James Joyce. So mm -hmm. uh, that's interesting that you come up with the same answer that she might. See, you know, you had to say she's extremely well read to qualify that opinion. And that is what you have to do <laughs> if you want to say that the emperor is wearing no clothes. Mm. You have to qualify that by saying, I've read a lot. I love Jane Austen. Right. I love it's a little bit of credentialism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have to say, no, 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 all these other literary canon, I like those. Yes, because I'm an educated, to have, refined person. I you're like all to have of those. one. Yeah. If anything, yeah. disliking one or, one or two members of the literary canon is evidence that you, yeah, genuinely admire the other things that you are meant to admire. It's kind of a way to double down mm. on exactly the fact that you like well thought of bits of culture makes you cultured. The fact that you've picked a couple to dislike somehow makes you even more cultured because then it sounds like it's, you know, <laughs> your genuine. actual opinion. Yeah. Yeah. No, I also wonder if it um, kind of puts you above other literary critics. I don't know if you remember that bit from The Princess Bride. I always think about this where uh, Vazzini, the, um, I, I just assuming you've seen it or read it. I have, um, yes. Yeah. yeah. So Vazzini, the, um, the, the brain of the, um, little henchmen who have kidnapped the princess mm. uh he's he's the orchestrator of the the whole scheme um he he's telling the 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 man in the in the mask or how intelligent he is he's saying oh, i'm i'm the smartest man you've ever met or the smartest man you ever will meet you, yeah. you ever will meet and he says you know uh you ever heard of socrates plato aristotle and man in black says oh yes and he goes morons <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's kind of, well to to uh, to put yourself above James Joyce, you know, and the other people who think James Joyce are good. You're saying my taste is superior, not just that it's different to uh, these other people. You're actually saying my taste is superior to these other people that I can criticize James Joyce. I I, I feel like Princess Bride is becoming part of the new canon the the cinematic canon maybe it's yeah it's like a modern classic um, it's maybe a modern classic it's not mm. the same type of classic as hitchcock but it's still one of those things that if you want to be received well into high society you you have to mm. you have to find princess bride funny i don't know if you have to find napoleon dynamite funny in the same way that's <laughs> kind of a S yeah, slightly cult, different cult community. Classic. That's a yeah. cult, yeah. You know, one. Um, All right. Not to uh, not 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 to take too long <laughs> on this, such, but I um, yeah, sure. I want to talk about the Princess Bride. Similarly, if you ever wanted to have me on a stream <laughs> to talk about the Princess Bride for two hours, I'd be happy to. But to to harken back to your uh, you know, the most important part of the film is music. The Princess Bride seriously fails on the music front, and I can't imagine what stratospheric <laughs> heights of culture it would have reached if they got a really good composer. To Is it too late to like rescore it? Yeah, probably not. The, I mean, a, you know, with AI, you can just. AI, I'm guessing one time. day you just be able to move. You can remove the entire soundtrack from Princess Bride and write your own. You, know, you have all of the same sound effects and the same dialogue. You can just take out the music and replace yeah. it. Well, uh, I'm going to give you 13 points for that, and that brings us to the high score table, um, which I have to manually refresh to find out where you've come. You're at the top. You are the highest scoring gauntleteer who has ever lived and uh, are embarrassingly far ahead of some of these people languishing at the bottom of the high score table. Um, uh, I feel like I'm overrated now. <laughs> congratulations, Poe. You are the the best gauntleteer who has ever gauntleted. Um, I want uh, to know what was the best segment of... Ooh. You know, well, it, seems... who did better than me in one in one part of oh, the right. gauntlet? <laughs> I thought you were su suggesting people should comment down below which was your favourite segment from this conversation. No, no. We, as we decided, they classic. were all thirteens and fourteens, so uh, they're all good. <laughs> of equal it's value. But that, that's what um, 
what what they call engagement bait, right? That you have to mm. right at the end oh, of yeah, the video you have to... tell people to comment something. Yeah, everyone who's watching at algorithm. this point, you have to comment a uh, leave an emoji and nothing else. Just leave an emoji well, about your your mood. Yes, because we we said at the beginning of the stream we were going to prompt people who actually listened to to do something. So an mm. emoji. Re representing your mood having just listened to the last two hours of conversation and everybody else until they reach the end of the stream will be mightily confused about all the emoji flooding the comments um yeah so well th thank you so much for joining me and congratulations on your new title of uh, master gauntleter well thanks for my score i uh I, I don't feel i deserve that i feel like i'm overrated well i uh, the way that i've set this really good up, mood today I, I am in a good mood, but it also strikes me that if you'd have known the significance of the scores as you were going, you would have you would have been more pleased about the scores I was giving you. Uh, that's a, it's, it's more like in retrospect. Oh, you're actually doing quite well. Um, good. All right. Well, let's leave it there then, and uh, perhaps you can Thanks. join me ne next year for another run at the Gauntlet. I, I will certainly.